Well, we will be looking at, uh, again, the book of Amos. We'll be spending the rest of this month looking at Amos. And today we are in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Amos, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. I'm grateful to the deacons for putting a, a watch here. I hope it doesn't ring when my 40, 45 minutes are up, but that is useful and it is an act of grace toward you as well as towards us, so thank you. You know, there are those who think that the Holy Scriptures accord uh, women a, a lowly, uh, uninfluential role in the life of society or of a family. But whoever thinks that has never read the Scriptures, certainly never read the Scriptures as they ought to be read. Because in the Scriptures, women are described as those who have tremendous influence in the life of a family, of a church, and of society. Sometimes that influence is good. Sometimes it is not quite as good. In the verses that we'll be looking at today, the first three verses of Amos chapter 4, women are described as the motivating force behind their husbands. And because the women of Israel at that time were far from the ways of the Lord, they abused their authority, they used it for negative purposes. And as a result of that, sin spread throughout the kingdom. I am reading as ever from the authorized Maoz version. You follow in your own. Hear this message, you cows of Bashan who are on the mount of Samaria, who oppress the destitute, who crush the poor, who say to their masters, bring and we shall drink. God, Jehovah, swears by his holiness that the days are coming upon you when you will be carried away with hooks and the last of you with fishing hooks. And you will exit one woman before another and I will cast you into the concubine's house, declares the Lord. As has been Amos's custom, he turns to his hearers, in this case particularly to the women who are hearing him, and he calls upon them, here, pay attention to what I have to say to you. Uh, this is something that we see repeatedly in the book of Amos. Uh, you can see it in uh, this verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Again, in verse 13 of the, uh, the same chapter. And then in chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 16. And chapter 8, verse 4. Here, here, here. And that is what the Word of God is for. It is for us to hear, and having heard, it is to heed. We are to hear whether we want to hear or we do not want to hear. We are to hear what God has to say about the way that we conduct our lives, because He is not indifferent to our priorities. He's not indifferent to our way of life. And, dear sisters, dear women, God is not indifferent to the impact you have upon uh, your family, your children, your husband, upon the church, and upon society. He speaks of these women as those who dwell on Bashan, which is the uh, mountain on which the kingdom of Israel established its capital. That is to say, Amos is turning to the women of the capital, those who have most access to power, most access to uh, all the decision-making process in the kingdom, to the women of the nob nobility, to the women of the king's court, and he calls upon them to listen to what he has to say. Because, precisely because of the position which they hold, they have a particular responsibility which they also bear. Thank God for those women 
whose positive contribution to the world often is hidden behind the curtain, but is highly significant, often highly useful. A good woman is one of the greatest blessings that God has granted a man on earth. But the women of Samaria were not quite that kind of a blessing. Their negative, sorry, their contribution was quite negative. And so Amos turns to them. He has not learned to be politically correct. Rather to the contrary. Hear this, you cows of Bashan, he describes them. Not exactly complimentary, I'm sure you would agree with me. But the prophet has no intention of paying a compliment in this case. He's not trying to win their ear by flattery, by sweet and kind words. No, no. He does not want to win their ear. He wants to challenge them. They have gone beyond the point in which he can address them with soft and gentle language. And so he chooses to place before them the word of God in its most stark, disconcerting, embarrassing, insulting terms. Uh, many times we hide uh, behind the uh, challenges that people place before us, saying that, well, he didn't speak very nicely to us. And Amos certainly didn't speak very nicely to these dear women, did he? If he had said it in a nicer way, I would have listened. Well, frankly, I doubt that. You would have found some other excuse. He raised his voice. He didn't choose the right time or the right opportunity. Of course, we do need to know how to speak the truth in love. But are we saying that Amos was inspired by the Spirit of God and yet... He did not speak the truth in love when he addressed these women in such a manner. Sometimes it is necessary to shock. Sometimes it is the right thing to do, and the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired Amos to address the women of Samaria in this way. And our sweet Lord Jesus could use sometimes the harshest language you can imagine. You hypocrites! You sons of the devil, you whitewashed graves, full of dead men's bones. Now those were the terms which our gracious Lord Spirit, our gracious Lord Jesus used as well. Were these words, you cows of Bashan on the Mount of Samaria, unworthy to be included in Scripture? And if they are worthy, are we not to listen to them, however unpleasant they might be? The truth is that we live in an overly gentle word, world. We, we are easily offended. And more often than not, we're offended because our self-love has been challenged. Our... our uh, the defenses that we put around ourselves have been uh, broken down. We're too busy with our self-image and with an effort to present ourselves in the most positive way possible, whether it is true or otherwise. And of course, uh, a lot of social media nowadays is used exactly for that. We indicate either how much we're enjoying ourselves or how much other people should pity us. And when our sin is exposed, we choose to be offended rather than turning from our sin. It's no longer as important for us as it ought to be that we would conduct ourselves in a God-fearing, moral, gracious, kind, honest manner. What is far more important to us is that we look good and the people think well of us, or at least if they don't think well of us, that they keep their thoughts to themselves. 
Hear this, you cows of Bashan who are on the Mount of Samaria. And of course, he is not referring to their physical looks. He's referring to what is in their hearts. This pursuit of, of pleasure and of comfort and this insensitivity to morality and to spiritual principles. Bashan is actually in the north of the country. An area that was well known and is incidentally well known to this very day for its very fertile area. Great grass grows there. It's one of the few places in Israel where you actually have four seasons. We hear, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 14, we hear of the curds of cows and milk of the flock with fat of the lambs, the breed of Bashan and the goats with the finest of the wheat. And why does Amos choose to speak to the women in such strong language? First of all, because uh, like the cows of Bashan, uh, the women of Samaria were full of pleasure. And secondly, because like the cows of Samaria, they were known for their strength, in this case, their influence. We hear, for example, of, uh, an, uh, uh, let's take Psalm 22 for an example, verses 12 to 13. You will be familiar with this psalm, of course, for obvious reasons. Many bulls have surrounded me, roaring lions that tear their prey, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. The women of Samaria, of the capital of Israel, were known for their influence upon the life of society. They contributed to the fact that society had become uh, hedonistic, pleasure-seeking, soft, materialistic, and void of any real fear of God, and therefore inconsequent of any real moral standards to which they would feel obliged. What was important for them was pleasure. What was important for them was comfort. What was important for them is bring, let me have. And so they motivated, motivated their wives and Amos challenges them. He challenges them for the way that their husbands behave. They who oppress the destitute and who crush the poor. Before we think about what that means, let's think for a moment how it, it touches us. What does it mean to oppress the destitute and to crush the poor? When a, a rich man, for example, takes advantage of his riches in order to uh, make available commodities at an exorbitant price, he is crushing the poor. He's oppressing the destitute. When the owner of a company requires of his employees to work harder than is reasonable and to pay them less than is reasonable, he is crushing the poor. He is oppressing the destitute. When a country taxes the population more than is reasonable, the government is oppressing the poor and crushing the destitute. When parents neglect their children in order to devote more time either to pleasure or to making more money in order to have more pleasure, they are crushing the poor. They are oppressing the destitute. When children despise those who are different from them, they are oppressing the poor. They are crushing the destitute. If a church ignores the needs, the pains, the sorrows, the longings, the failures of the congregants, then that church is crushing the poor and oppressing the destitute. The poor, the destitute, are those who do not have the means to meet the challenges of life, 
be they financial or emotional or social or whatever else they may be. And to crush, to oppress, is to break into pieces. It's to drag down, to trample down, to take advantage of. And how do the women of the northern kingdom do this? Well, Amos says, they say to their masters, it's interesting, they're described masters, which is another word for husbands, but really the masters of the house are the mistresses. We often say that the man is the head of the house, but the woman turns the head. And that is so often the case. And so they say, bring. Amos says, bring, bring, and we shall drink. Bring and uh, we'll enjoy our time together. Ignore the consequences. Ignore what is involved in bringing. All I care about is bring. Let's be engaged with ourselves, with our pleasures. Notice the word there, bring, they say, and we will enjoy. And so they're promising their husbands the enjoyment that they expect as well. But it's just us. It's no one else but us. Bring and we will enjoy ourselves. I don't care how you do it. I don't care the cost that involves others. I don't, declare what you, I don't care what you neglect. Prayer time, uh, uh, time at the church, whatever it may be. Bring and we will drink. Let's have another cruise. Let's go to another place. I need to buy another pair of shoes or another uh, dress or whatever else it might be. I was shocked when I visited the Philippines and went to Amadella Marcus's house and saw she had 3,000 pairs of shoes. A whole room about the size of, of this auditorium with racks of nothing but shoes. Bring, bring, and we will drink. Women have tremendous influence on the family, on the church, on society. Even though that influence isn't always obvious or direct, they impact. About two years ago, I, I read a book by Ann Douglas called The Feminization of America. And she describes a process which took place in the 19th century when the American society found its interest in truth eroded. Instead of that, a, a culture of, uh, of materialism, of consumerism, of bring, bring and we shall drink, self-indulgence, a kind of narcissism that put man at the center of the world. That, I won't say it's a root, it was the stem, the root is elsewhere, earlier. But that is the stem of our present day life when so many pastors are no longer pastors. They're cheerleaders. They're, 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 they're feministic comforters. They're not prepared to call us to change, to point out our failures, and to cause us to stand before an holy God and see ourselves for what we are. I think it was Billy Graham who said that he would have been nothing if it was not for his wife. And someone else rightly said that behind every great man stands a, a greater woman. And behind every poor, empty, vacuous, miserable man stands a woman who is demanding and all she wants is bring and we will drink. A woman can destroy her husband. She can build him up. She can become an obstacle that will keep him from growing and developing and, and using his gifts for the praise of God and the good of society. Or she can be the kind of person who will encourage him and, and motivate him and challenge him. Or criticize him when he needs to be criticized. Only when he needs to be criticized. 
women have tremendous influence. Thank God for women. It all begins in our lives with why we choose the spouse we choose. A, a woman who's looking for a husband who will give her stature, uh, who will buy her all she wants, who will satisfy her unending appetite for love and attention, is a woman who marries for the wrong reasons. Incidentally, that's as true of men as it is of women. Women who choose according to spiritual and moral standards. Women who choose in the fear of God will make the right choice. Because marriage above all, like human life, like all of human life, is meant for the glory of God and for his honor, not for the provision of our needs primarily. God is glorified by the provision of our true needs. But you know what our truest need is? To glorify God. And that is where we find the kind of peace that we so crave so often. Bring, bring, and we shall drink. Husbands, be careful. Be sure that you respond to your wife's true needs and to a little more than her true needs, but that you are not governed by your wives. You remember the story of Nabus Vineyard? There's crybaby Ahab. He wouldn't sell me his vineyard. I'll show you how to rule in Israel, she says. And she got him his vineyard. Or do you say vineyard? How do you say it? Vineyard. Very good. Then you say it right. <laughs> she got him his vineyard. But at what cost? Doesn't matter. As long as she got him what he wanted, and that way she got what she wanted. Proverbs tells us, give, give. The leech has two daughters, four that will not say enough. There are three things that will not be satisfied. Earth that is never satisfied with water, fire, and Sheol, and the barren woman never says enough. That is true. On the other hand, Proverbs says, have you find, found honey? Eat that you might not have it in excess and vomit it. Eat only what you need. But there was no way to satisfy the hungers of the women of Samaria. Certainly not those in the capital. They wanted another toy in the kitchen. Another piece of furniture. They didn't like the piece of furniture they wanted. They wanted another curtain in the room, whatever it may be. Where is true womanly beauty? Well, for example, Psalms tells us in Psalm 45, verse 14, that the king's daughter is all glorious. Do you remember the rest of the verse? Within. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Peter has something to say about that. He tells us in his first letter and. He says, wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not only be merely and actually only and merely are not in the text, but rather your adornment must not be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses but the quiet, hidden person of the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, 
and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Take, for example, the woman in Psalm 31. She's no nincompoop. She's not someone who's tossed about with every whim of the world around her or of her, or of her husband. And that's why her worth is far more than Jews. And the heart of her husband praises her. Indeed, an excellent wife, who can find? She does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. And if you look at Psalm 31, you will see a woman who is industrious, who is independent, who is competent, who is thoughtful, who dares do what is necessary. For our home uh, devotions, we're reading through Bavinck's The uh, Wondrous Works, or is it The Glorious Works of God? It's one of my favorite readings, frankly. I knew it, I won't tell you how many decades ago, under a different title, but it's, it's a marvelous book, and I warmly recommend it to you all. Let me read a portion relevant to what we're talking about that Bavinck wrote. Adam, he says, could not find a single creature that was related to him and could be his helper. Then, when man could not find the thing he sought, then quite apart from man's own witting and willing, God gave the man the thing he could not supply. The best things come to us as gifts. Thereupon, the first emotion to master Adam when he wakes up and sees the woman before him is that of marveling and gratitude. He does not feel a stranger to her, but he recognizes her immediately as sharing his own nature with him. Literally a recognition of that which he knew he missed and needed, but which he could not himself supply. She is out of Adam, and yet she is another than Adam. She is related to him, and yet she is different from him. She belongs to the same kind, and yet in that kind she occupies her own unique position. She is dependent, and yet she is free. She is after Adam and out of Adam, but owes her existence to God alone. She is man's helper as an individual, independent and free being who is responsible to God. Now, the women of Samaria, on the other hand, were not like that. They turned their husbands into their helpers, into their satisfiers. And therefore... The whole society in Israel against which Amos repeatedly veins is exactly this. They have lost moral sensitivity. Slowly but regularly, God has lost his place in the life of the nation. Instead of them have come desire for self-satisfaction. When their husbands prayed, if they prayed... They especially prayed for the things that have to do with this world. If they came to worship God, they did so in order to get something out of God, rather than coming in order to give and to recognize God's worship. If they served in the temple in any other way, they did so because they could make a living from it. And their hearts were distant from God, attached to this world and to the love of this world and therefore to themselves. And so the destitute were oppressed and the weak were crushed and injustice became a way of life. And so society was unaware of what was actually happening. It was it was tearing at itself. It was, it was in a course of self-destruction. And that is why God sends Amos and calls upon him to challenge these women, to challenge this nation, to challenge these men. The days are coming upon you when you will be carried away with hooks and the last of you with fishing hooks and you will exit one woman before another and you will be cast into the concubine's house God, Jehovah, swear, swears by his holiness. 
The days are coming. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may be next year, but the days are undoubtedly coming, and God is the one who is bringing them upon us. When you will be carried away with hooks, he's now describing them in terms of a, f a fish, dragged away with hooks, and the last of you with fishing hooks. And then he says, you will exit, that is, you will break through the walls. One woman before another. And I will cast you into a concubine's house. Instead of satisfying your lusts, you will be the tools for the satisfaction of the lust of others. And who will do this? I will do this. Sisters and brothers, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man or a woman sows, that also they will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And those who are selfishly ambitious, those who do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, to them wrath and indignation awaits. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul who does evil. Thus says the Lord. And it is our duty, therefore, to hear these words and respond to them. Woe betide us if we do not. Let's pray. Holy God, you see our hearts for what they are. Purge them, we pray. Move us so that we shape our, the lives of our family around you and your will instead of around ourselves. Teach us, Lord, to love you more than we love ourselves and to love our neighbor as ourselves so that, we, so that we serve you with holiness and with humility, with pure motives, and so that our love for one another would be sincere, not hypocritical, not forced, but pouring forth from a heart full of gratitude because of what you have done in our hearts. We pray this so that you would be glorified in us and through us. And we pray it in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen.